Good morning. First, I just want to sympathize, and I'm with everybody who, who cannot clap and sing. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I think it's a great way to start every single service. Uh, because if I'm a guest here and I see how you people can clap and, and sing together, hey, I f- I'm starting to feel pretty comfortable already. Uh, if I'm passing by and I hear that, that's a crowd I can hang out with because, <laughs> hey, I'm not perfect. So things look a little different around here, and I hear that's what a baby does to your life. Um, You ever wonder why your dad's so good at building things? It's because he's got to get all this new stuff, and he gets to build baby cages and changing, (laughs) changing stations, and I don't know what that thing is. It looks like you could launch something across the from the balcony with it, but. That thing, actually, in order to get it out here, we had to break it down, and heaven help the child that's in there if it ever happens while it's in there, because that thing folds up into, I don't know what the shape is, but it's bad. So we had a baby, and everybody loves to talk about babies, to look at babies, to hold babies, and when I say that, I'm also with the people who raise their hand, who don't really like to hold newborn babies. Um... It's not because we don't like babies, it's because we love babies that much. Um, They're just so small and we just don't want to hurt them, they're just fragile. (laughs) Everybody loves to play with babies and everybody thinks their baby is the best baby, right? Until Mary shows up and she actually has the best baby. And they're right, babies are great, Uh, but what draws us to babies and small children? We kind of already we kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, what draws us to them? They're cute. Uh, little kids are funny. Um, they're innocent, and they just have this purity about them. And that's what we're going to be talking a lot about today: is that purity, that word pure. Um, which is why I'm really thankful for Dean's scripture, uh, and I truly do believe that God uh, kind of ties things like that in together when you don't even really mean to. Uh, Because I didn't talk to Dean about um, what the sermon was going to be about, but what he read is this sermon. It's what the sermon's about. In fact, I'm going to read it again. Um, But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for our sins. He provides it. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to angels um, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Uh, Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Uh, Pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for this time you've given us. Uh, Lord, just to gather here freely um, to worship you. Father, you do deserve all of our worship. All of our praise, it goes to you, God. So we come before you today humbled uh, just to say thank you for all that you've done. Uh, Thank you for the way that you came into this world and what you did while you were here. Uh, It's in your name we pray. Amen. And I've always kind of found this um, amazing, Uh, even sometimes a little bit confusing, how God chose to come into the world as a human. Um, A king, a king by all rights, king of kings and lord of lords, uh, chose to enter this world as a little baby. Um, And it's weird because they've been hearing about this Savior come for a long, long time. Um, In fact, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And then there was silence. Nobody heard anything. Well, then we have this baby. Um, With all these attributes I would never give to a baby. A king, a counselor, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. Uh, Then you have this guy who... You know, dress is kind of weird, and you maybe wouldn't want to go get lunch with him. 
I don't know, maybe it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, and he starts talking about the Savior. Uh, the Savior who's coming after him. And John, John's pretty cool. He's, uh, you know, he's got his, he, people are coming out to him to see him, to get baptized by him. And he's, um, and he's saying, hey, look, there's one coming after me, not me, one coming after me that I'm not even worthy to untie this guy's sandals. Oh, that's great humility shown by John. A lot of good lessons in that, too. <clears throat> um, John, John was preparing for the Savior. Just like we prepare for babies, uh, John paved the way for Jesus. And he gave his message of repentance to prepare the hearts of the people to meet the Savior. That's been talked about uh, for hundreds of years. And then Jesus steps into the scene and he starts his ministry. And Jesus uh, talks about purity. Uh, the scripture um, that we have has a lot to do with purity, says, has a lot to say about it, and aligns it with all sorts of things. And when I think of pure things, I think of things like uh, precious metals, like gold and silver, and I don't know, horses. You know, you have pure, uh, purebred uh, dog bloodlines and stuff like that. Uh, things that aren't mixed. And God and the world do not mix, right? God is pure. In Matthew chapter 5, which is where we're going to go first, um, Jesus has just started his ministry, uh, and he's really making some noise. You know, there's a lot of people coming from a long ways to see him, um, to get healed by him. He's healing people, casting out demons, and he's preaching. Uh, Jesus sees all these people, all these people coming, and he goes up on a mountainside, and he just... He just lays down some teaching. I mean, if we want to listen to the best sermon ever, don't come here when I'm preaching or when Brian's preaching. We should come here and read the Sermon on the Mount because that is better than anything we could ever say is God's Word. And the people were amazed at this teaching because this man was preaching all this stuff like one with authority. Not like their teachers of the law do. So in Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you uh, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Catch that. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now when we are talking about purity, especially when we try to combine it with humans, um, this, this sounds kind of odd to me, because I know about the human condition. You guys know about the human condition. We're messed up, right? We're not pure. We are not pure in any way, shape, or form. The closest we ever got to being pure was when we were babies. And that's why we love babies so much, right? Because they're so pure. They're not, they're not yet polluted by this world. And we're drawn to that purity. Lisa said it. They like to hold them. Have you ever seen somebody walk into a room holding a baby? All the women and all the older folks, they just... Boom, they just go right there. They just want to hold it. People are drawn to those babies. And 
and even, even young people, <laughs> you always go with age here. Every time I say something about age. Okay. Um, but even, in, even in, in my life, uh, when I'm out in public somewhere, and this has happened to everybody, where there's a young kid, and they just kind of blurt something out. Kids are the masters of just blurting stuff out, right? And it's funny, right? Uh, and even when they, or they throw something, they're just doing whatever, wherever. Um, they bump into you. They interrupt you. More often than not, we laugh with them uh, because it's okay. It's cute. They're kids. They're innocent. Until they reach that age, then it's like, seriously, just, just stop. <laughs> All ages. But he said, the pure in heart will see God. I want to see God. I don't know about you. Uh, so go with me. We're going to be going all over here. Uh, go to 1 John chapter 3. We just kind of walked through 1 John, so I'm going to kind of go back over some stuff here. In chapter 3. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 3 here. See what, great, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. I kind of like that word, lavished. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be, has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope, all who have this hope in him, purify themselves, just as he is pure. First, let's just take a moment to look at this wording. Um, all these words, these lavished uh, children of God. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. When we read that, I got this picture of a dad and his child. You know, a father's love for his kids is a very powerful thing. I mean, if you think about it in your own life, you guys are, you guys, most of you are fathers or have a dad. Um, and if, if you haven't had that good relationship with your dad, know that, know that this is for you because he loves you so much. And that's how God is looking at us. That's how God is looking at you, his kid, his child. Now, we get, all, we get a lot of looks from our dads, right? Really look. I've had that one. Uh, the you're, you're in trouble look, maybe the finger even comes out. You. That one, that one comes out. And you know, God might look at us like that sometimes. Um, I don't know. I do know that I have certainly uh, done things that deserve those looks. But most often, those looks stem from a deep, deep love. And now that we are children of God, what we will be, Someday has not yet been made known. But when Christ appears, guys, we're going to be like him. Catch that. Catch this wording here. We're going to see him as he is. What a great day that will be when we get to see him. Man, catch that. And all who have this hope, hope is such, a, such an awesome thing because it's so powerful. The power of hope. All who have this hope in Him, in Jesus, purify themselves just as He is pure. Let that sink in for just a little bit. If you want to be pure, where is your hope? I hope it's in the one that is pure. We're not pure. Far from it, actually. But we have Jesus. We have that hope in Jesus. That's where the purity is. We get up in the morning... And we acknowledge the fact that 
I cannot do this on my own. I need Jesus. See, when we, we get up and we, we clothe ourselves in that righteousness, we put on Jesus and you're pure. He's got you covered. So remember to do that. I need you. Lord, I need you. That song is so powerful because it is so true. So I'm going to go to Psalm 51. We're going to read Psalm 51 together. And like I say, God's word, this is better than anything I'll ever be able to tell you. So let's go there and let's just be covered in God's word. Catch this. This is the most important part of this sermon when we go to God's word. Maybe, maybe Psalm 51 is a prayer in your life right now. It's a prayer in mine. And even here, when we read this, um, we read these words, Jesus is here with you saying, I know you've sinned, but it's paid for, so come back to me, just like a good father does with his child. So let's go here and read this together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great passion, Blot out my transgressions. Man, this is a prayer uh, for me, and I hope it's our prayer. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will, t then I will teach transgressors your ways so that the sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Do not delight, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous one and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. I would encourage you to go back through sometime today and read that. Make that a prayer for you. Create in me, O oh God, a pure heart. That's where it's going to come from. God creates that pureness, not us. But he says something about wisdom in there too. And that's kind of where we're going to shift gears and go next is pure wisdom. And the Bible tells us of two kinds of wisdom. And we're going to go back to James. We've been there uh, once today. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. There's two kinds of wisdom here. Who is wise and understanding among you? I would ask that question. Who would raise their hand? Yeah. Let them show it by their good life, 
by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wow. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So when I think about wisdom, I, I think about knowledge. Uh, but after, after I read this, after I read this, uh, this passage here, what God's telling us, um, and I consider how the wise show their wisdom through a, through a well-led life, uh, deeds done in humility. And humility is, is a topic that is hard for a lot of us. It's very hard for me because um, pride kind of takes, takes root and kind of takes hold. Uh, but when I, and this is confirmed kind of when I seek wisdom from somebody else, I'm usually seeking um, wisdom in what I should do next. What's the next action I should do? So I go to somebody that I consider wise. And that, like I say, that, that kind of confirms what, what Scripture's saying here, uh, what the Bible says about wind, wisdom, because we seek those people who have those qualities, who have led a good life, uh, and who show their wisdom by the works that they do. Because pure wisdom comes from heaven. And I, I hope that we seek somebody who is, who is leading that good life and showing those good fruits of the Spirit and I also hope that we can find in somebody and go talk to somebody that is not afraid to speak truth into our lives. That, that's a big one for me. Even, even when it's going to hurt me, you speak truth into my life, thank you. Thank you so much. Don't try to make something up from what the world says is good or what you should do. Uh, be straight up and speak truth. And I hope that we can do that uh, when people come to us. Uh, because I know that if it were me, I do appreciate it. Where you go to seek your wisdom is very important. So we're going to take a look at the wisest man to ever live uh, to find out how he got to be that way. And to do this, we're going to go back to 1 Kings chapter 3. And this is where a good speaker would have something to talk about here to give you some time to flip through that. But I, <laughs> I've had it all marked out before we started the sermon so I can just kind of flip back and forth because I know the Bible that well. Just kidding, I guess. The First Kings chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to look at Solomon here. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Solomon made an alliance with, uh, with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought, to her, he brought her to the city of David until he was finished, b finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God, asked, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And as we come to Christmas time, um, 
just know that Solomon right here has an opportunity to write out the best Christmas list ever because it's God asking, God saying, ask me for whatever you want. Yeah, the world's first Christmas list. Um, but how, how Solomon responds to this is key. It's very key in how he got his wisdom in this, what it looks like. Um, so, so let's just read it. I'll be quiet. Uh, six, through fif- 6 through 15, Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in this place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? So Solomon didn't ask for, you know, that fancy new thing. Uh, he, he asked uh, for a discerning heart to govern his people, to, to take care of God's people. God, just give me that heart that you want me to have, that you want your servant to have to address your people. And going on in verse 10, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for a long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast um, for all his court. Solomon asked for a discerning heart to govern the Lord's people. A wise choice. We know that he was wise and there was no one else like him. And it's because of where he went for his wisdom. That discerning heart. You know, I'm sure there was a lot of smart guys Uh, A lot of, and women, a lot of smart people, good business uh, men and women, and teachers and philosophers around at that time that Solomon could have gone to, but instead, um, he gets an opportunity to ask God for it, and we have that opportunity to ask God. So he's faced with the Lord in a dream, and there he asks for the heart to lead. I know that God can do anything through people. I know he can. But I would bet that things might have been different for Solomon if he had um, gone to people or if he had chosen to seek that wisdom and that heart from anywhere else. Have you ever noticed that God gives way more than you ever asked for? Uh, And this might be off off topic a little, but uh, let's take a moment and think about your own life. Think about the ways God has blessed you. God has given me way more than than I need, way more than I ever asked for. And he does the same for Solomon. God was pleased with Solomon's answer. So he gave him that wise and discerning heart. But also with that, he gave him wealth. He gave him honor, a long life. And all these other things that Solomon could have asked for, God gave it to him anyways. He asked for the right thing with that humility that comes with wisdom. And God says here, here's your whole Christmas list. Good job. He had that opportunity to ask for, ask for that wealth, ask for popularity, honor, all that stuff. But he said, the thing that I need most, God, from you is a heart 
to lead your people. And God says, bingo, perfect. I love that answer. And because you answered with that, here's all the other things you wanted as well. We know that wisdom from heaven is pure. And that wisdom isn't just being intelligent. It's actually got a lot to do with humility, which can be tough in the way that we lead, the way that we lead a life, uh, the things that we do. But the point is, wisdom from heaven is what we need to seek. Because this world is ready. It is ready to give you all sorts of wisdom. Let's have the wisdom. Let's have the discerning heart to choose correctly where we go to seek wisdom. And that is to God. Uh, to end things off here, we're going to go to Philippians, the fourth chapter. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And I, I do kind of feel like we should sing the first verse. Uh, maybe that's a camp thing, but we sing that a million times at Central Iowa Bible Camp. Uh, Rejoice in the Lord always. Can I say here each? <laughs> yeah. Let your, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Think about those good things, those pure things. Keep your minds right. Stay focused. And this is hard because there's about a million and a half things cruising by all the time, right? In my mind, based on what I see or what I hear, you know, there's a ton of things going by me, and sometimes I get kind of like a dog chasing cars. I chase after one, then I see another one, I chase after another one, and before you know it, I look up and I'm you know, way farther than, uh, than when I started. And maybe some of you guys can go there with me as well. And in that moment, that's when, that's when we hit the ground. That's when, we, that's when we pray to God. And in that moment, that's when, we, that's when we put on that righteousness. We put on Jesus. Because He's there with you. He'll meet you in that, in that place that you are. I promise you that. I promise you that. He's been there. I've seen it personally in my own life. He will meet you where you're at. And in that moment, we put Him on. We hit the ground in humility before God. That's where we put it on. That's what he wants you to do, because only through him can we be pure. Hey, I love you. God loves you. So have a great week. We're going to sing, and then we're going to have a meeting afterwards. So thanks.